thank you all for coming. And I'm going to be talking about perceptions of effectiveness of essentially cooperative learning environments. And I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I've, I've kind of put this together to explain to people what I'm doing in my classroom. So, um, so I'm doing this project as a part of the Faculty Teaching Excellence Program, President's Teaching and Learning Collaborative Project. <laughs> it's a nice long title. And Clayton Lewis is mentoring me, and Jackie Sullivan is my coach for that program. So the Engineering Education Research Colloquies um, put out a report talking about the fact that there's not enough engineers. We're, we're really doing a bad job of recruiting engineers, and we're doing a really bad job of keeping them in engineering when they do come to school. So um, the report kind of asked the question, how can the education community develop a more intuitive approach to engineering education? So how might we do that? And the thing that I've been playing with is active learning in a cooperative environment. So I constantly have the students doing things. So what's cooperative learning to me? It's a teaching strategy where students basically start understanding knowledge um, through their participation on small teams, sometimes with very different levels of ability. Again, you know, teaching is as good as learning sometimes. You, when you teach it, you learn it so much better. And an atmosphere of achievement is created. There's a sort of a bond you want to achieve, you want to get to the top. And when you're working with people in a collaborative way, it tends to be a very fulfilling experience. So in cooperative learning, the students, they discuss the concepts and content being learned. They teach their knowledge to others. They're always thinking about what, what's going on in the class. It's a very active, they're in the electromagnetic framework, which is the class I'm using to teach this with, but you'll notice it doesn't come into the lecture very often. <laughs> um, they practice orally explaining pro problems. That's very different than sitting there and just thinking of it in your head. Actually having the oral uh, explanation is a really big step. Check for understanding with each other. They can check in and figure out if what they're thinking is right or if they need to come check with me. And I do give individual tests to check for hitchhiking. So there's a, a reasonable percentage of their grade that is done on an individual basis, but a bulk of their grade is done in the group work. So why use it? To increase student retention, we help um, develop, develop the oral communication skills. Promote student self-esteem. If they're working with someone and they, again, it's that achievement thing, they get really excited about it and they feel good. And often the students, you know, when they're working problems at the end of class and things, they don't want to leave my class. You know, the next teacher's coming in and they're like, no, we still want to work on this. I'm like, class is over. <laughs> So, and it enhances the student satisfaction with their learning experience, and I think that showed because they, they stay. So, what course is this? The students are coming from electromagnetic fields, ECE and 3400, and it's a five hour, it's been a five hour course. This semester, this last spring when I was teaching ECN 3410, which is what I'm lecturing about, um, it was a five hour course. I brought in students from three different semesters, so they had three different professors in my class the, for the previous course. Um, it's a, it was done in a traditional lecturing, three hours a week, and then there were two two-hour labs a week. Um, but this fall it became a three-hour course, they dropped the lab component, which is very sad. <laughs> um, why, but why was that? Why did they drop it? Well, uh, in my department they decided that we had too many labs, so, and labs are expensive. So what they did is they knocked our core classes back to three hours instead of five, and they created a lab class that does electromagnetics, that does circuits, that does whatever needs to be done. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> we, we were told we would get at least three full experiments, and we aren't getting those. So we're, we're unsure of what the future brings for that. <laughs> so electromagnetic waves I taught in the spring semester, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, how that went. I had 45 students. It was a three-hour class split into two, an hour and 15 minutes. So it was a Tuesday, Thursday class, and there was no lab component to this class. So my pedagogy for this class is that it's student-centered learning, um, students creating their own knowledge and taking ownership of it, setting up an environment for them to learn electromagnetics, communication, and lifelong learning skills that will empower the student to really go out and, and feel like they know how to learn things, and mentoring them through the process. 
they don't necessarily like it, and some even extremely dislike it. They have, and I'll show you a couple of comments from FCQs where they were very upset. Um, one, one student made a comment that it seems like she was more of an administrator than a professor. But I, I think that fits with facilitator, so I'm, <laughs> I kind of think it's an okay comment. <laughs> so my course layout. I do, um, I have the students do concept content daily lectures. I do lectures when I feel like the material is difficult and they're, you know, it would take a lot of work to be able to get the students to understand the concept enough to teach it. But for the most part, I have the students, I break down the material into very specific concepts and then I assign it to different groups, they're in teams. Um, and they have to get up and, and present the lecture. And I'll talk more about that in the next slide. Um, I say actively constructing knowledge. So I give weekly quizzes. Um, there's coursework, meaning in the classroom, we actually are doing the work. Um, so it's, it's sort of like homework, but it's in the class that we're doing the active, act, active work. Um, we do homework because the students want homework. They want more examples. They want more things to do. Um, I didn't want more homework when I was in school, so I, I'm kind of surprised every time they come back at me with that. 40% um, is the exams, and I'll explain the individual and pair when I get there. Um, and then my final is, I say content to concept, because the final is a conceptual final. Um, we do a lot of problem solving and working throughout the semester, and then I want to see at the end of the semester, do they understand the concepts that I wanted them to learn? And just a funny comment, my TA asked me, in the spring, he said, has your class decided on a grading scheme yet? <laughs> because all of these things that I put up there, I may put it up as, here's my suggestions, but what do you want to do? So some semesters, homework is more than 5%, because that class feels pretty strongly that they need 15% for that. And maybe the coursework, even though I think it's important, might drop to 5% or go up to 15 I mean, it's, I let the students argue and sort of create the environment they want to create, and then that drives partly how the course is, is going to be run. Melinda, so these, these percentages refer to um, some sort of weighting on, on, a, on, a, on a grade, not um, like the percent of the class time or effort that is being spent on these activities? Yes. Yes. They, um, yeah, definitely. It's just the, they add up to 100, so the grade that goes with that. I'll talk about more what, where I do that. Um, so the daily lectures, students are assigned a short content concept to teach. I offer to meet with them. They take me up sometimes, sometimes they don't. Um, the lectures tend to be about 10 to 20 minutes, and there might be more than one lecture a day. So we might do a 10 to 20 minute lecture and then do some work and then go back to another lecture on a new concept. Um, it's hard because I always have to be ready to correct misconceptions. And because they don't always come in to see me before they present it, very often there can be slight misperceptions. I think it's okay for them to do that and then me to correct it because I think students learn from errors more than they learn from what they do right. I think they remember that better. Um, so the way I grade the daily lectures is if they just put the equations from the book on the board and sort of say, this is this, um, it says 70. For putting the equations from the book on the board and explain them with depth, go through some of the theory with it is an 80. 90 explains the concepts really well gets into the theory, and does a book example. So just pulls one of the examples from the book. And 100%, they have to explain it really well, go into the theory, and then do a problem that they've created that's appropriate for the concept that they're trying to teach. Do you give them this rubric? Yes. Yes. And sorry, I mean, how big is the class? 45 students. Wow. Um, so, so, and how, how many of them are doing this lecture together? Two. So, um, so every 20 lectures, so out of 30. So people get to do this once or twice in the semester? No, they just do it once. I pick up a lot of the other lectures. I just, it's a one-time shot for them. Yeah. And, and I've had students end up with a zero on it because they say, we're not ready. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> so I do their lecture. <laughs> um, and that, you know, after the first couple students do that, they start realizing that you can't really predict really well where the course is going or how long it's going to take to get through a certain concept, depending on what we're working on, especially with the problems that they make up. Um, because I don't, know, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take to get through all the steps. If it's going to be really difficult or pretty straightforward, 
Um, and that's one thing that the students struggle a lot with is not having that schedule of I'm going to present on this day. I give them an, an estimate that's early so that they are going to be prepared if we move quickly through things, but they don't always, they're like, oh, well, we were so far away, we didn't think we needed to do that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, so the other thing I do is a weekly quiz to help ensure students are keeping up with the material, which is essential for a good collaborative experience. Um, it tends to take 10 to 15 minutes. I assign the topic very clearly. It's not meant to be like a problem to be solved that's really, really hard. It's, this is what I'm going to ask you. Make sure you know this by Tuesday. Um, and then I'm quizzing conceptual and or content knowledge. It's not a hard, hard driven. Um, what I want to do now, just for a minute, is have you pair up with somebody, so somebody who's sitting next to you or whatever, and see if you can answer these questions. If you don't have a piece of paper, I have some cards here you can write on. Yeah. residence halls. How many got that one close? Yeah. All right. It has about 90 research centers, institutes, and laboratories, and I think those are like named centers is what that means. And it has about 200 classic rural Italian-style buildings and complexes. Did anybody come close to that number? 200? No? Awesome. <laughs> Did you do it by yourself or with your partner? No, no, it was a team effort. Team effort, okay. <laughs> well, we had real difficulty defining what Italian style was. Yeah. Well, we, uh, almost <laughs> all the buildings on campus. Almost all the buildings on campus. Yeah. So what happened 
when I ask you guys to do this? We all did it. You all did it. You engaged. You talked to someone about it. You felt good about it. You were laughing. Um, and that happens in the classroom when I do pair quizzes. The energy just goes skyrockets. Everybody's engaged. Um, even, even the students that really hate what I'm doing engage in the pair quizzes. <laughs> Um, because it's, you know, that's the reason they come to class is to take the quizzes so they can leave. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> peer quizzes, on an individual quiz, students are immediately concerned with usually what they know or don't know. And they start going, I don't know this, how am I going to figure this out? And, and they start getting nervous usually when they're taking it by themselves. On the pair quiz, they're collaborating and they're thinking more like, we can do this, we can figure this out. You know, if we all sort of put our guesstimates in together, um, we can start converging on an answer that's maybe pretty reasonable. And students are constructing knowledge through talking with someone, back to the oral representation of the problem, and coming to a common conclusion. And that sometimes is challenging. I have um, one student that did not like this at all because he had to argue with someone about what his answer would be. And I was like, that's great. <laughs> so there's a lot of things the students don't like that actually make me happy that they're doing. <laughs> So in classwork, um, there's specific problems assigned to work in groups of four to six, and I think in the future I'll limit it to four students. I think when I went to <laughs> six, there was too much room for play and students not actually engaging with the group and things like that. So I really think for most of the things I do, I'll have two or four students in the group. And I wander around the class nudging them in the right direction. I'm, I, you know, I'll, I'll give them part of an answer if I can see they're not going in that direction and, and get them back on track to get to the, to the final solution. Again, just like the quiz, lots of energy talking, using EM vocabulary. I'm kind of big on the vocabulary and using the right vocabulary for the technical expertise that you're trying to learn. Um, and I think you learn it much better if you talk it, <laughs> if you're not just, again, doing it in your head. Um, it can be hard since they work at different rates, but 32% 32, 32 reported that this activity was the most significant learning that they did in the class. So it was, it's, I was kind of surprised at that because if you look at some of the survey FCQ stuff that we did, it doesn't, it doesn't come out, the, the in-class work doesn't necessarily come out as something that they've changed their minds about or, or whatever, but this was a huge percentage, I thought, to feel like this is the most they were getting out of the classes when we did this. Of course, that's where a lot of the complaints come from, too, because I'm not lecturing, I'm making them do problems. Um, and like I said, if it's at the end of the class, they don't want to leave, for the most part. <laughs> so they work individually in a group or in a group for homework. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what to do with homework, and I'd love any suggestions. Homework is not something that I ever figured out myself when I was in school. It was just like something I had to do and turn in. Um, so in the future, I was thinking I, I usually have them just turn in one assignment per group, um, and I was thinking maybe having them each write out their own solution set. I won't worry about it being copied from someone else's. That's fine if that's what they want to do. But at least I'll go through the content writing it down once. And that's maybe a little more uh, than they're doing it. <coughs> so what do I do on exams? Well, I'm doing collaborative learning in the classroom. I'm um, doing in the, in the classwork, in the homework, in the quizzes. Everything is pair problem solving sort of problems. So the exams are problem based tests similar to the group in class in homework. Um, they're graded 60% as an individual with one page crib sheet. So they come into class on Tuesday and they have a front of one side of a page crib sheet and 60% of their grade is going to be on what they get when they turn it in at the end of class. And so um, the when I give them the test, I give them two copies of the test. So they can, if they want to, copy over from one test to the other and then go home. And if they do a take home, they can turn it back in and it's worth 40% of their grade. And so the whole retake has to be done, not just parts you do wrong, which is how I used to do it and I could never keep up with the grading. It was crazy. But if I just make them redo the whole test, then it, I can just grade an extra set of tests. It's not that big a deal. Um, and this really relieves a lot of pressure for a lot of the students. They still study very hard for the in-class test because it's 60% of their grade, but now all of a sudden I've said, okay, you can take this home and redo it and see what kind of grades you get on it. 
Um, you can do it with your pair or alone, so with your partner or just alone if you want to do it alone. And it's, uh, I don't have the percentage up here, but we'll get to it in the results. Um, it's a pretty reasonable percentage of the students that really like this and it helps them. Yes? Um, are these pairs assigned? Like They choose them. So what happens if you have one member of the pair that wants to do it alone and the other member of the pair that would like to do it together? The other member of the pair would check with me and then I would find another pair for them to work on and do it in a group of three. So, yeah, they just, you know, I keep telling them it's a two-way street and if they will just at, talk to me, I'll make very reasonable, you know, accommodations for them. So, I guess I do have it. Um, students reported learning a lot on the take-home test. Um, they said things like they'd never really gone back and looked at a test after they took it until they were studying for the final. So they don't like go home after the test and say, oh no, I gotta figure out how to do all these things. And when they do that, it's a very intense experience because they're studying for the test, they're in my class on Tuesday taking the test, and by Thursday, when they come back to class, so 48 hours later, they're turning in a take home, which they wanna get 100% on. So there's a lot of pressure to get that you know, done completely. Um, 23% of the group self-reported that it was the one most helpful thing in learning the material. So again, that's a pretty reasonable percentage that felt like in doing this kind of exam that was a really good learning experience. Um, and I think, again, I said this before, but retention of topics where the students make a mistake is often a stronger memory than all the ones they got right in the first place. And if you think back about some things you've been involved in, often you can remember the things you did wrong and how you should have done them but you don't always have immediate access to the things you did right. How did you decide on 60-40? I went from 50-50 and went to 60-40 and <laughs> thought next I can try 70-30 if it, I don't know. But well, what, I mean, what made you go from 50-50 to 60-40? Oh, I wanted the in-class one. Okay, so that's a good question. I, I probably was thinking 50-50, but then I wanted the in-class one that was the individual one to count for a little bit more than the take home. So that's why I just shifted it to 60-40. No real good <laughs> pedagogical reason, just my gut feeling. So Melinda, yep. um, on the take home portion, you said it's paired, but um, mm -hmm. do, you, I mean, do, do they get together in, in their usual study groups of four or six and talk it over? No, they don't report that they do that. It's, and why don't you want them to do that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I suppose they could do that. I just tell them to work in pairs and they do. There's no reason they couldn't work with the homework group. It's, it's just, you know, anytime something is for a significant chunk of your grade, this is 40% of exams right. themselves are 40% of your grade. Right. Uh, you know, that puts a lot of pressure on students. It um, does. To, to want to, and, and so, I can just imagine that there'd be concerns if you're paired up with someone and you discover that night that that person is not really helping you get 100%. Yeah. Uh, there could be a lot of frustration and yeah. anxiety. There is, definitely. But again, I'm trying to prompt them to convince themselves that they're right in such a way that that's the consensus they'll come to to turn in the exam. Um, usually, so are you thinking that like one student would not do his problem or something? Well, I, I just, you know, when students work on homeworks together, there's often, um, you know, a bunch of them get together in a, in a help session and all of a sudden there's eight minds working on this problem together. And it's very likely that they will, they will get the correct solution and all of them in the end will produce a right. solution. And, uh, and, and they, like, they like that and I don't, I don't know. I mean, okay. if it's about grades, then you might be worried about whether this is inflating grades in some way. Yeah. It's about students, it's about students learning. <laughs> you know, I'm not really into grades. <laughs> so it's, yeah. So I, I appreciate your comments. That's a good point. Um, so it's my final exam. Um, the final is a closed book, closed note concept test. At the beginning of the semester, I give them 40 plus concept questions about the four different topics that we're going to be talking about. And I tell them that they should do these as we go along during the semester. They should write out the answers to these and things. Um, and then at the end of the semester, I pick about 20 of the questions and that's the in-class final. So they have to come in class, no crib sheet, just come to class with their pencils and 
write the answers out to these conceptual questions. You know, it could be, um, can you explain the difference between group velocity and phase velocity? So some sort of question like that, where they'd have to have a little bit of, um, they, they have to have studied for it and understand it. They're not just going to do it off the cuff. The average grade is about 85%. So by giving them the problems and then just handpicking ones from what they did, makes me feel like they probably know close to all 40 of them because you know, I'm randomly, randomly picking them and they're doing really well on it. And if they've mastered these concepts, I think it's a huge step forward for the learning of this topic. And it's, it's an interesting way of looking at it, but it's a little bit of a translation from problem solving back to concepts, which I think is the way I learn best. <laughs> so it's the way I'm, unfortunately for some, teaching my students and, and getting them to work. So another thing, I didn't do this semester, but it's just because this semester got very confusing. Um, but I usually do reflections, um, one-page papers where they observe, read, or experience something related to the class and bring it back into the classroom, trying to get that social relevance to what we're doing. Um, for, for this specific course, it could be something with cell phones or antennas or you know, things, that, things that are really practical that affect our lives. Um, it connects what they're studying to their lives. They practice writing, which I think they need to do, and they learn to write concisely, which is another, I think, important point. So we developed a survey, and Megan Gilmore's here. She's going to wave. <laughs> She's the one that worked with me on this. Um, so we were attempting to gather qualitative and quasi-quantitative data. And what the survey really is is self-reported perceptions of learning. So I didn't like grade a whole bunch of problems and code them and say, oh, they forgot this concept. I said, are you comfortable with this concept? Um, or do you like this style of learning that we're doing? So the technical content that I asked them about goes all the way back to calculus. Are you comfortable with these calculus topics? And then are you comfortable with these topics from fields one? And now in fields two, are you comfortable with these topics? So we did that pre and post the test with some interesting results. So if you look at this, at the start of the semester, the, even the ECN 3400, the blues, which are some depth, are, are kind of not really big there. Um, if you look over to that side, the blues have filled in here. So they've gotten at least some depth in the, to in the topics for 3410, the class I'm teaching. Um, but the other interesting thing is if you look in here at the ECN 3400, a lot of the blue bars get much larger too. So in my class, because I was forcing them to do review of old, old things and stuff, they actually report that they learned that, you know, that they understood the topic much better. So this is just a raw scale. Took the end minus the start average to see their comfort level. And calculus actually went down a little bit <laughs> after they took the course. Um, ECN 3400, as you can see, bumped up. And then also the topics that we covered in 3410 bumped up. What's on the x-axis? On the x-axis are specific topics, okay. right? So it's scalars and vectors, Cartesian coordinates, okay. cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Um, and the things we're doing in 3410 are plane waves, transmission lines, Smith charts, wave guides, and antennas. One big deal, which was part of the problem this semester, is that with the three different professors, the students d already did some of the stuff in 3410. So for some students, it was a huge review, and they weren't very happy about that. Um, but other students hadn't seen it, so I mean, I needed to cover the material. So the next thing we looked at are what learning elements helped you the most. So we have working in pairs, working in small groups, working individually, weekly quizzes, seeing and hearing the professor work problems, work problems done in class individually, work problems in the class with others, take home exams, in class exams, giving presentations, asking questions in class, combined home and class exam, which is what I, I, I do in this semester. So at first they don't know anything about it, but then they report it back. Seeing and hearing the professor lecture, vocabulary quizzes and pair quizzes. So these are the topics that we just sort of grabbed and put together to say, um, it's actually what learning elements help you most in your STEM topics. So it's actually supposed to be not just for my class, but in general, which of these methods help them learn. So missing here, or I'm missing it, is uh, the presentations that they give, watching other students give that. Is that, is that um, it? it is. 
But yeah, it is, it is there because, and I'll tell you what the result is. The students report that they learn a lot from lecturing, but they do not learn a lot from being lectured to by the students. So, so sort of a classic pepper, where you have fourth graders teaching third graders, the fourth graders learn to tongue, the third graders don't learn to squat. Right. But what a good way to learn. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what about when you lecture? When do I lecture? Um, I have seen here professor lecture. Um, they were, I did so much of the peer teaching this semester that I think those numbers actually went down, like they got worse. They used to think it was good to have a professor lecture, and now they weren't as sure because I wasn't doing it. <laughs> um, so start of semester, end of semester, what activities helped me to learn in STEM classes? And it ranges from a lot in the, it looks like a brownish color, rust color, to some in the blue, very little in the purple, not at all in the red, not sure in the green, and never experienced in the brown. So from the start to the end of the semester, these things shifted around a little bit. And so this one here is combined home and class exams. So they started at 1.64 as an average of how they felt about it, right, is how they felt about it. And they moved up to a 3.49 on average is how they felt about it. So you have an increase of 1.85 on a five-point scale, um, which is kind of all right with me, given all the different things they, they were doing. And we didn't really think about it, but we scored zeros on some of the never experienced, which is going to pull the average down. So I, I mean, we need to go back and look at that data again. <laughs> this is my first pass at this data and first public talking about it, so I'm happy for suggestions. Um, taking a pair quiz started at 1.79 and ended at 3.4, so that went up. They felt like the pair quizzes were definitely something helped them learn in STEM classes. And so then we said, what were the most helpful learning experiences? And you can choose as many as you like. And so when they did that, they came up and said that working exercises in small groups, definitely everybody pretty much put that down. Um, pair quizzes came out high. The optional individual take home exam. Um, and lecturing to other students in short lectures is down there at, I think, 1.7%. Sorry, this is a little blurry. <laughs> if we we're allowed to choose one, what was the most helpful learning experience in the class this semester? Um, they will, or you know, a large majority said working on exercises in small groups. The next one was the optional individual take home exam and then the weekly quizzes. And I have a pie chart that sort of shows that a little better. So they're somewhat spread out. I mean, different techniques were working for different students, um, which is obviously the goal that I'm trying to get to in a collaborative classroom, is that I, tr I try and get everybody to a place where they're comfortable with what's happening. So in the usefulness of learning activities, we were able to split out the women and the men. And um, it, didn't, it doesn't show anything dramatically different. Um, the women don't change a whole lot from the beginning to the end of the semester, what they thought was going to be a good learning experience was indeed a good learning experience. But if you see towards the end there, um, this is where I failed. See here the professor lecture in class? That went into negative, so that got less important to them. And then the one right next to it is the combined in-class exam, in-class take-home exam. Um, that had a pretty big thing from, it was down at one, and it went up to like 3.5. So that was a big difference in that. And the other thing at the end is the pair quizzes um, also went uh, up quite a bit. And the men look somewhat similar. Again, the combined home lecture and class exam, um, taking, pairs, taking pair quizzes was up. And I think everything else didn't move a whole lot. You can see the ripple down at the bottom. And then comparing the two, um, the, the one big difference is for whatever reason, and my N in women is only six, so um, it's, it's not as broad as the men's, but they perceived that vocabulary quizzes, which some of the quizzes were pretty close to vocabulary quizzes, um, they, at the beginning of the semester, they didn't think they were so great, but at the end of the semester, they thought that that was a really good learning experience for them. 
So my grades for this class, this semester, so I've been doing little things in my classes for years, little cooperative learning experiments and things. And this semester I sort of decided to go full blown and just try it all, try to make it completely collaborative. Um, I still did some of the lecturing, but I think that's okay. Um, but my grades ended up smushed into the Bs. And, and it may have to do with the percentages and the way I have them set up. Um, but there's a reasonable amount that's an individual grade. I think it's like 40 some percent is individual and then 60 some percent is, or 59 something. Um, so, I mean, there is an individual component. And so I think maybe what's happening, and I'd be happy to hear any other ideas, is that some of the A students who sit in my class like this, leaning back, you know, with their hats pulled down, um, those A students are maybe not learning. And so when they get to the test, they're not doing real well. So some of the A students are falling into the Bs. And I think the C students, and this comes back from some of the comments too, being given new modalities for learning tend to do better. So they're doing better than they normally would. So everybody went. So I need to figure out how to spread that out a little bit, maybe. Or maybe I just think it's okay. <laughs> so from the survey, um, this is the open-ended questions. So they said, th these are the more positive ones that are meeting the need. So are we addressing the needs they have? And it says, I've learned a lot about EM. I'm more comfortable with it compared to my first EM class. Um, I wanted to learn more in depth about EM, and I did in this class. It improved my knowledge of EM waves. I learned about antennas and cool applications. This class did meet my goals. I learned how to apply what I learned in EM1 and added even more fundamental material. I didn't do anything specific where I said, here's Fields 1 material, now, now apply it to this. They were doing that on their own. So I was really happy to see that. And, it, and you could see it in the fact that it increased quite a bit um, from the beginning to the end of the semester. Um, and it said they learned about Smith charts before, which means they already did plane waves and transmission lines and Smith charts, which is like over half my class. They've already done in Fields 1. So, it was nice to have a positive comment, even though he was probably very bored. Um, and said it was a good continuation of 3400. Now for areas that need improvement. I feel like we could have learned so much more if we used our time more efficiently. Though I did learn a lot, even though I have to admit that most of what I learned came from my own independent studying and not the professor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. Um, I felt that I learned a significant amount about waveguides, most of the material. Other material was a review, so the first part of the class felt very redundant. Well, I've got to get back to my group that teaches Fields 1 and get them to decide on what's going to get covered. And we can add more, we can add optics to this course. You know, we don't have to cover plane waves in this course, but some of the students need it, so it's really challenging. Um, one student said the fact that I learned best by reading a book and talking to my professor and friends one-on-one -on -one was reinforced. And one said, I learned a lot, but it just went really fast, which is like the opposite of what most of them. So he's probably from the class that didn't do any of this material. Um, and I was maybe going through it at a faster pace because so many of them had. So we did a group interview where, you know, they come in and they put you in groups and you come up with things to, uh, that you want to put on your strengths and areas to be improved. Um, and so this is a combination of the strengths and areas to be improved. Spending the first two days on historical information. Well, I just think it's really important to set the stage of who these people were, how they did what they did, and what some of the politics and different things like that that play into what's going on with history. And I was actually very pleased to find out it was a 50-50 split on if I should present that or not, because this is what caused the group interview. I did this the first couple of days, and the A students, I'll call them, <laughs> went to my chair and said, <laughs> This is an odd. <laughs> We're not doing this. The history is not allowed. 60-40 on students learn from student teaching. Now that differs from what they're saying in the graphs. They're not, well, at least it's not coming up as a main contributor to their learning. 80-20 um, on pair quizzes are a good thing. So there's some students that probably get frustrated like Steve's talking about where, you know, they're paired up with somebody who's not really helping them. Um, 83 to 17 homework is good for solidifying concepts. So they want the homework and they want lots of problems to solve. Um, quizzes would be better at the end of class. I give them at the beginning of class. There's pros and cons to both of that and it's a 50-50 split in the class. Um, most of them said less review of 3400, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> so we've got to figure that out. Um, 5446, so 
50%, sort of 50-50, have professor lecture instead of students. I'm starting to get some students that are seeing the value in having students lecture. And 93-7, <coughs> more examples from material in class. We do a million examples. <laughs> I don't know exactly what that means, but most of them said we need to do more examples. So that was that. Here's a couple of good and a couple of bad. So one of them said, I enjoy the way she teaches, and I think the various ways of teaching help students stay tuned in and keep the material interesting. Um, taking the quizzes in pairs is nice, because in real life you can throw ideas back and forth with someone. But then we have, I do not agree with Professor Pickett May's style of teaching. I'm paying a lot of money for this course and would prefer the lectures to be given by the professor. And then another one about money. <laughs> I think that having students teach the class is a tremendous waste of my money. I taught the course to myself. I want a refund. <laughs> so those are sort of, you know, I, I handpicked a few good and a few bad ones. And then just here's the references to the different material I was pulling it from. Any questions? All right, be happy to discuss. Mostly the pairs stayed the same. Um, occasionally, a couple of them would switch up on me, and I wasn't worried about it. Um, they if would I saw, do that. Hmm? Uh, they would do that the yeah, um, because partially because well, maybe these two can get together at the same time this week, so we're going to get together. Um, I watch for stragglers and grab them and put them in pairs, <laughs> so they have somebody that they're working with. And you know, I understand Steve's concern about you know what if you get a good and a bad, but I really think that teaching element is really important. Um, and if they're responsible for getting that person to understand the topic, provided the student is willing to learn the topic, <laughs> um, then that can be a really good experience. So it sounds like you said to them, find a partner. Yep. Yep. Yes, Mike? Uh, I'm curious, what percentage of people in engineering go on into engineering to certify? Is there a... Oh, There's professional, a, the yeah. professional engineer. I have no oh. idea. <laughs> it, it varies with subdiscipline. Civil engineers all get professional licensure, and electrical and mechanical tend in. not to. Yeah. But we do try to track, you know, what our students do afterwards. So, um, and you don't thirty percent I know go out and get jobs at least, and I, we don't hear from the other percentage in engineering. So yeah. 30%. That's the, we, we hear from 30%, and of that 30%, 90% say, yes, I have a, a job in engineering. Mm -hmm. and so, so <laughs> in chemistry, the American Chemical Society has standardized tests. Huh? Do you have, there's nothing like that in engineering. Because I'm always, you know, I'm always concerned <laughs> because you're so purporting, I mean, mm -hmm. yep. yeah, like I, I took this herb, you, I feel better, some yeah. people got sick when they took the herb, you know, and, you know, it's a little mushy. So, yeah. so is there any way to standardize it? To um, it's well, there's the, really concept, there's the concept exams, I think. But you um, make those up and grade them. Right. But, I mean, there's the, there's there, in physics, there's concept exams that are well documented and everything, right? Validated. Right. Validated. Yeah, thank you. Um, we don't have those in engineering yet, but I definitely think it's something we should be doing. So I, I agree. And I had... Uh, um, do you ever do something like just have another professor who teaches the same material generate the questions and grade them? Because you don't need to, you need to spend a lot of time building exams if you just can sort of get, your, get yourself out of the loop, right? Mm -hmm. You just can't be the person generating the exam and evaluating the outcome. For the survey, you mean? For, and for the survey is... Is yeah. relatively trivial, right? right. But for the content knowledge, it's much trickier. Because you know, well, one can tune. Sure. One can either tune the questions, or one can teach to the concept test. Right. right. I mean, there are ways of. Sure. So I suppose I teach to the final in the sense that I try and make sure we go over all those questions during but the I mean, semester. But other professors who could build, you know, like a three question or or some kind of yeah, short assessment definitely. and then grade it. And then they would see whether or not, or, <coughs> or even give it to them. I mean, there's how many sure. sections of the course are there? There's yours. Yours is the only section. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I could definitely have somebody do that, and they'd probably be very happy to. 
since they're from the more traditional route of lecturing, and I think the students, yeah. See what they, what they, um, what they do. The class is going to be taught by a lecturing professor next semester, and I'm hoping he's going to be willing to let them do the pre and post survey. And there are open-ended questions that we haven't analyzed yet, saying explain Maxwell's equations or explain this or explain this using words. Um, that we, we haven't gathered that data at all yet. So, yes. I wonder if you might be able to get some data from the class if there is one that follows this one about what that professor thinks about what your students know. There isn't an exact class that follows this one. This is kind of a terminal class. Um, you you could maybe go to some of the people in optics that probably have to have this class to go into optics. It's a, it's a good suggestion. I'm just not sure. There's no. Whereas from 3400 to 3410, there's a clear, you know process, 3410 is sort of, okay, you've done it. And it's, I should say also, it's one of those courses where there's a list of three courses and you have to take two out of those three courses. So not all the students have to take this course. Um, so there's a little bit of self-selection. Um, yeah. Noah? Yeah, well I had a uh, comment and, and question, questions plural. Um, so, uh, two quick comments. I mean, I think I think this is great. I think opening up your class like this um, in both ways to make the education something that the students engage in and participate in, mm -hmm. as well as the reflection on the nature of the class. You're mm -hmm. asking these questions to the students as an educational activity in its own right to have them maybe for the first time in their engineering career mm -hmm. reflect on what the nature is of education, what that happens. So I, I, I could imagine that actually not only do you get interesting proxy data, Mm -hmm. um, whether or not the students are accurate, but you can also, I mean, some of those data are going to be really valuable in and of themselves directly as the kinds of things you might want to evaluate. Do students believe that this matters? And maybe that's part of the goal of the class in its own right. I mean, it exactly. depends on what your goals are right. in, the, in the class. So I, I think that that actually um, can be sort of really tremendous there. Um, Second comment was, you, since you said the first time you were presenting these, I think yeah. it would be great to look at some of those shift data that you have, if you have enough numbers, to look at them on effect size. So it strikes me, so if you looked at the standard effect deviation, size? effect oh, yeah. size. Okay. So if you effect looked at the, the number of standard deviations yeah. and shift, that that it's would, actually yeah. quite possible that you'd be able to see something that's, that's a significant mover in those areas. Yeah. Um, no, that's, I, I was thinking about that as we were developing it. I just couldn't get to that before. So then I had a question, though, for those of the rest of us who um, uh, struggle with doing these very things that you mm -hmm. suggest, opening up the class to the students, about the relative um, cost benefit that you perceive of opening up the class to have the students give the lectures. I think it's a great idea. I tried doing it. It hasn't always worked for me. In fact, right. generally it doesn't. You suggested here that it might not be. Mm -hmm. um, I could imagine it being very effective, but with an extraordinary amount of scaffolding on your end. Absolutely. Absolutely. But but they're in groups of two, so it's really only 22, okay, 20. 23 groups. Right. Um, I Out of 30 lectures. <laughs> right. True, yeah. Um, but sometimes they go two in one day okay. because yeah. they're, they're pretty short and we do problems and then come back to a lecture. Um, I think one of the ways to, to work on that is to maybe require them to come talk to me and, and like you said, put the scaffolding in place and make sure, so I'm not just catching the misperceptions and saying, hold on, let's think about this differently and that sort of thing, but actually really have them much better prepared than they are. Great idea. Doesn't that triple your workload? Um, I, I don't know. I think, I, I think it's, it's doable. I, I've okay. been thinking about that actually quite a bit, and I, I really do think. I don't know, Megan, what do you think? Well, I mean, it's just this must be supporting the EO, and I think you're going to see you. Right. So. so, requiring it, I don't know, that might make a difference. I mean, <laughs> interestingly, when I was an undergrad at Oregon, this is how a couple of our upper division bio courses were taught. We were okay. assigned a topic, and we had to present the mm -hmm. topic in class. In those situations, we were required to go and talk to the yeah. Faculty member beforehand, and we also had fixed dates. Yeah, you knew when you were going to. Right, and I, I, that clearly is difficult for the students, as I have a huge amount of fluidity in my class. Yes. Are you um, explicit with the students of why you're doing this? Yeah, actually, I, I talk to them about. I start off the class, sort of um, tuning them into what it is I'm doing, and some of the other FCQ comments were, we did the group interview that was midway through the semester. Um, 
We told her that we don't like doing, giving the lectures, which it was 50-50. Um, and she didn't change her mind, you know, she didn't change her teaching method. But I had told them it was 50-50, I'm going to keep doing it because I think it's important. But that really upset them that they gave some feedback and it didn't get used. So, um, yeah. So just thinking about the student-created mini-lectures, mm -hmm. I did a variation on that that I think was successful, mm -hmm. in that instead of having students actually teach directly, mm -hmm. I had them create reference material for other students, and then that material lives on longer, people can come back and see it. So the idea that they would have a worked problem or an explanation of the concept that works different from the textbook is something that they can have as a reference. And um, I did get positive feedback mm -hmm. for that, and I did get people came and used that material, so that's an alternative. Okay, great. I'm sorry. <laughs> you so you yeah. seem surprised that the grades um, uh, clustered. The, all went towards the middle. Yeah. So from A to C, they went to C's. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if that's just because in the pairs, the A students are paired with somebody who's not who's less than an A student, and the C students are paired with somebody who's better than a C student. And so, um, and you're grading, you as I understand it, mm -hmm. and maybe. Um, you included their individual grades as well as their pair grades, their their grades with the pair. Yeah. And so I wonder if you just look back at the individual grades, if you could take out um, how they did on those pairs. Oh, that's a that's an excellent suggestion. Yeah, yeah. that's then a really excellent suggestion. Right. I'm wondering whether you're running a, a danger of a lawsuit from somebody who feels that they got a lower grade because you biased it. I mean, it's not. I mean, in theory, they're going, individuals go to college, not sure. groups. Right? right, right. And while it's nice, you know, in the business world, you work in groups all the time. Yeah. This isn't the business world. Well, and that's what they say, too. The, another couple, some of the comments are, I didn't take this class to learn how to present material. But, you know, I have, I say at the beginning, our recruiters tell us, you guys don't know how to present technical but material. That, and, that, and that's a good point. Yeah. But the question is, this class is not a class on presentation. Right. This is a class mm -hmm. on engineering. Right. And mm -hmm. I would be, I think it's extremely, no, no. well, I think it's you extremely circum dangerous to give people grades for group work unless you can figure out whether that is discriminating against people. There may be people who just don't want to work in groups, yeah. and they're getting and they're getting discriminated against. Actually, the engineering, standards. The engineering standards. All of our department, all of our programs are accredited on the basis of including communication skills and teamwork skills, skills as, well as central as central to engineering. In that, they you know the the accreditation agency actually doesn't like it split out. We're not supposed to have a separate class in how to work in teams and no, I'm, I'm actually, do so professional I get skills. That, but I'm saying, you know, if a person's grade is coming out of, I mean, it seems yeah. problematic mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. Because, I mean, it seems problematic to me. So, so if I just look at the 50% of the grade that came from That's a lot of the, the individual. Grade. Yeah. I mean, that could easily bias the results. I mean, you actually have data that biases the results. Yeah. This but is they actually well, or measures what your goals are for the class. Hmm. Right. And maybe that's why the A students weren't so happy. Because some of their grades were lowered by this group. Yeah. Well, just, just out of curiosity, well, I mean, that's I like all I promise. You have no evidence exactly. actually how it's happening to the A students, right? Yeah. You don't have anybody who was an A student who's no longer an A student. Is that right? I don't know. You're right. right. I, I don't know that. Um, Since only 30% are going on apparently in engineering. You may have just pissed somebody off. No, no, no. What? No, no, no. Ninety percent are going on an engineering. No, thirty percent responded. Right. Yeah. So. Well, we don't know anything about the other ones. No, we don't. <laughs> no, I, I understand you. Yeah. I mean, I just well, think, I think I think you know social engineering is fine. Yeah. As long as you're taking responsibility for it. Right. But you're subjecting these people. I mean, do you have an IRB to do this essentially? Yes. Did, well, no, I don't. I have an IRB to. Do the survey. But the, the teamwork, the team and the team grading aspect of it is totally common in engineering. It's, it's normal. Yeah. They have entire courses, their project I mean, I, I courses, where you know yeah. the, where the individual uh, achievement is a very small part of the grade, and most of it is is based on what their and, team achieves. And e interestingly enough, I do end up with a lot of pairs that are at my office hours every week. 
because neither of them are the A student or whatever, yeah. and they struggle. They talk to each other. They try and figure it out. And actually, I'm really pleased with how far they get, given that they don't seem to have the background to really understand what what I want them to be understanding. And by just giving them a few clues into what they're trying to do, they can turn it around and get it out. And then they're very proud of that. You know that they've been able to grab the concept and, and do I it. Comment just one. I mean, how does a person get to a three thousand level course without having the background to do the course? Uh, they got a C minus in all the progressive courses. Yeah, yeah. It happens, it happens all, the all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's it's uh, yeah, it's kind of scary. I would agree, but there's some that do slide through yeah. without question. Yeah. So going back to Steve's question about are they actually staying in their pairs mm -hmm. or not? When you asked them this, were they anonymous or not? If they stayed in their pairs or not? Yes. Everything, all the questions were anonymous to me. Megan took, did the surveys with them through SurveyMonkey. Um, the was their name attached to it at all? On, on the surveys, um, I collected them with names so that I could actually match the beginning and the end of the semester. And then she never saw any names associated with the surveys at all. Once yeah, I cared yeah but they're, so, so in their mind, though, their name is still attached to their answer. And they've been told they should work in pairs, but we know the students are, are working in groups when they're at home. So I find it hard to believe that they would stay in their in their pairs. Uh, you know, I'm not real concerned about them staying okay. in their pairs. Actually, I mean, you, you've all brought this up now, but it's not. I, I really don't have a problem with more of them getting together. Okay. If that's we're, we're, if they want to do the the eight person group think, you know, more power to them. But okay. it's we're, it's just sometimes the. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it works as well with six or eight people. I think it works better when you have four people working together. But anyway. It is now officially 4 o'clock. So we're officially Anyone wants to continue informal discussions? Yes. You're on your own. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.